say that to me it's very straightforward that God's creation is enacted through evolution. I'm very aware that in later this morning and this afternoon we're going to be hearing other points of view and part of what I'm here to do is to explore how to fit that all together. Um, in, bio, in Hawaii, I'm actually an astrobiologist these days, which means that I research the origin of life and think more and more about how that exists within a cosmological context. Having said that, this morning I'm going to keep it very simple and talk about the origins of biological information. And please, in the questions, if you feel that I haven't addressed origin of life, origin of information in that sense, that would be a good time for us to talk about it. But OK, enough preamble. Um, where I'm going to begin today and where I'm going to end today is the same place, which is a quote from a paper that we published last year in Perspectives. Uh, I'm, uh, forgive me, I'm going to read it out to you because I really want you to think about this quote and this is where I think the whole content of the talk resides. Okay, I think I can... ...known as DNA. Something similar happens when gravity causes raindrops to form puddle, and the shape of the ground beneath becomes reflected in the underside of the water. I'm now going to hopefully in about 20 minutes tell you that I... Just that's the way I see it, all right? So let's go off. Clearly, biological organisms carry a lot of non-random information. And the question that we're at least addressing, focusing on for the first part of this morning is whether natural processes can account for the emergence of new genetic information that would be necessary for those organisms to be there. This talk is gonna suggest yes. Now let's start here on a point of commonality, I think, for all of us who are presenting today that natural processes clearly can increase genetic information in certain well-observed ways. For example, natural processes can be observed to make new copies of DNA. That's one way in which new genetic information arises. Whether we think about humans producing children, cells dividing, or right down to the molecular level of DNA strands copying themselves, there can be no real argument that that is one way in which genetic information increases over time. And let's stress from the outset that I don't think that's really where the debate is. I don't think anybody is arguing that that isn't possible because it's something that anybody can observe. In fact, if we go one step further, we can say that well understood molecular processes can transform any one genetic sequence into any other genetic sequence. This is the foundational material of a genetics or even a bio 101 course is to know about things called point mutations that would take the individual letters in a strand of DNA and change them one to another. Other types of mutation known as insertions and deletions, or indels for short, can add genetic material or take it away. Now many of those errors are actually associated with the copying process. So there we have at least a mechanistic framework for understanding how genetic information arises. And again, I don't think that there's any discontinuity, any disagreement about the fact that these occur. And please correct me if I'm wrong, those who are representing a different point of view. So I want to move past that and get to the real issue here, which is the issue of certain types of information and whether certain types are difficult to account for. And let's start here with a question. If I were to pose to you the question, which of these three images carries the most or the least information, I suspect that your answers would depend upon which discipline, which scientific area you're coming from. If we have the AV guy back, um, I don't know if he's there, but if there is any chance that these lights could go down a bit, that would help me enormously. All right, but that gives you a moment to consider the pictures. One more show of hands. How many of you here are physicists, particularly theoretical physicists? Wonderful. And if you were to look at that series of pictures, I guess I'd better put words in your mouth and keep it rhetorical for the sake of time. I'm guessing that you would suggest that the picture on the right is the one that contains the most information. That would be from an entropic point of view is the most unpredictable, the most randomness is within that picture. And that is one way that we could measure information. But if I change now and said as a different question, which of these three texts contains the most information? Then we're talking about something different. For what it's worth, the one on the left there is a one-page letter that was written by a young man in, during the American Civil War to tell his father that he'd survived one of the big bloody battles there. Middle, we have the yellow pages, and on the right, we have the complete works of Shakespeare. Clearly we're talking about information there, but we're not talking about more information is more randomness. There's something else going on entirely. 
Now, thankfully, Lauren is here to take this theme and run with it later in the morning. But all I really want to do for now is to stress to you that information is not an unambiguous concept. And if we want to talk about increasing information, we should recognize from the outset that we're not necessarily talking about increasing randomness or about increasing content. So let's take that and reapply it to thinking about evolution. And there's a, uh, a large glossy figure that came out of a relatively recent evolutionary textbook depicting what it saw was a summary of the evolutionary process. And a final question for my talk is to ask you if anyone here would care to tell me whether they think there's something wrong with that picture, that depiction of evolution. It may be hard for you to see against these lights, but it's sort of spiraling upwards from rocks that are four billion years old. Slowly we move through algae into the earliest multicellular life. Then towards the top we hit the dinosaurs, and then it spirals round, and at the very end we see the arising of humanity. Where did the first coded molecules show up? They're pretty ambiguous because we would be, but it would be somewhere down about three, three and a quarter billion years ago, I would think. Three and a half, maybe. But is there any philosophical objection that any of you would see with that sort of depiction of evolution from a secular point of view? Interesting. Okay. Just for what it's worth, if you do study evolutionary biology these days, most evolutionary scientists would tell you that that is rather misleading because it carries a deep cultural connotation that Darwin was trying to get away from with his theory of evolution. That's the connotation of progress. It shows a very linear pathway to evolution. It shows evolution ascending from slime and goo through progressively more complex organisms until it arrives at the most complex organism of all, us. And it's very hard to tell with this lighting. I do apologize for that. But let me just tell you that if you could make out that rather pixelated image, it would be of a white male. And really what that's telling you is that it was a white male who drew that picture. And were it had been to a black female who drew that picture, hopefully it would have ended up with a black female as the pinnacle of evolution. But that's the philosophical objection I want to get away from right now in this talk, is that evolutionary theory, the way that secular scientists study it, does not predict that humanity was a necessary outcome of evolution or a pinnacle of evolution. In fact, those of you who haven't done biology for a few years may well have been more familiar with this picture of life's diversity, what we call the five kingdom system. That one is completely out of the window these days. Okay? That would be a modern, objective view of life's diversity shown there. It's what we call the three domains view. And just to try and make this point for you, what we did recognize as three kingdoms of life, the plants, the animals, and the fungi, are now a little twig at the very end of one of these three branches. And if we measure life's diversity in terms of changes in genetic material, DNA sequences, which is what you're looking at here, we find out that you are almost indistinguishable from an oak tree or a mushroom, and that life's true genetic diversity is all within the microbial realm. And in fact, the two branches that you're seeing there, one of them is the bacteria that we had down as a kingdom before. This other group, under a light microscope, looks almost indistinguishable from a bacteria and wasn't discovered until we had molecular technologies to reveal that there are two different types of bacteria out there, as different from each other as either one is from you or I. Okay. One more thing here, and this is getting a little bit more controversial for those of you who know your biology, but this is one attempt to recognize how complex we are in terms of genetic information. And it's a bar chart that shows the ranges of genetic material that you would find in different types of organism. The dotted red line shows roughly where humanity lies in terms of the single copy amount of DNA that you're carrying, the amount of genetic information in your genome. We occur roughly midway in the mammals, the top bar there. Plenty of mammals with much more genetic information than you, plenty of mammals with less. More challengingly, as you move down some of those bars, you'll begin to see other organisms which, to an intuitive way of thinking, should be much simpler than you are. I'll just point out one for now and tell you that right down here in the protozoa, single-celled organisms, you would be able to find species of amoeba that contain orders of magnitude more genetic information than you do. So from that perspective, once again, we have this idea that there has not been a simple linear ascent through the evolutionary process. That is not what secular evolution perceives as going on through evolution. Okay? In fact, I'll just really run this point home to you and tell you that Darwin himself used the word evolution precisely once in The Origin of Species. If you didn't know this, it's just a fun factoid to wheel out at a cocktail party. But it is literally his last word on the topic. 
He uses the word once in the passive tense as the last word of the last paragraph of the last page. He says, basically, thus, through these processes, this is how things have evolved. The reason that he avoided that word was that it was already in common usage by the time that he was writing. The word evolution had been brought in to describe this process of biological change over time about 100 years before, and it had been introduced by developmental biologists who studied how a single fertilized cell could grow into a human baby. And they were the ones who said, well, look, if a single fertilized cell can grow into a complex multicellular creature such as a human within nine months, why not some similar analogous process operating over longer periods of time in nature, transforming one species into another? That's where the word evolution comes from. In fact, it comes from the Latin to unroll of a script or a preordained plan. And that was why Darwin avoided the word, because in the public consciousness at the time he was writing, evolution already was there as a concept, with this idea of an increase and unrolling of a plan, an increasing in complexity. And Darwin made the foundation for what we recognize as the modern version of evolution, precisely by getting away from that. What we're looking at with that older idea is a concept of a ladder of evolutionary progress and an associated concept that each living species is somewhere higher or lower on this ladder. And that in turn, I'm sure many of you know this as well or better than I do, but has very, very deep cultural roots that go back to Aristotle. And in his philosophy, it was intuitive that plants are somehow more than rocks. Animals are somehow more than plants and humanity is somehow more than animals. And that was an idea and a philosophy that was adopted by the Catholic Church, heralded through Western, or shepherded through Western civilization, and formed a cultural backdrop to most scientific thinking through the Enlightenment. So that was the idea that Darwin was getting away from, and that is the idea which is incredibly widespread and difficult to get out of the minds of young undergraduates when you're teaching them evolution. There are just four cartoons to illustrate it. I could find you 400 more in an eye blink. And you can think about the last time you saw evolution referred to in a pop culture context, a TV commercial, something like that. I almost guarantee you that it would have had this context of increasing complexity over time. Bizarre. Even a lot of people who think that they support the secular view of evolution think that this is what they support because they haven't actually read the decent facts about what the science is measuring. Okay? And to be fair, there are plenty of museums, particularly in the early days, who re have reaffirmed this view. And there's just one particular example, the classic linear progression that leads to humanity. So we shouldn't be too eager to blame the public and say that science has been preaching a different message all along. But let's go back and check what Darwin actually said. Darwin said something very simple. He said that more individuals are born than can survive. These individuals vary from one another, and the variations are inherited from parents to offspring. And if those three conditions are met, then there will be a struggle for existence meaning that the inherited variations which best fit an organism to its environment are those that come to proliferate over time. We can take an incredibly abstract example. Consider two types of thing, a blue thing and a red thing. Blue thing leaves behind two copies of itself, red thing leaves behind three copies of itself. Over the generations, the red thing will come to dwarf the blue thing in terms of the population numbers. And if we come back and visit that population, we see a population saturated by red. Notice that there is nothing there that says that the red thing is more complex more progressive, an improvement, it simply left behind more copies. And that's what Darwin was all about. So, when we think about progress, evolutionary progress, from water to land, from fish to re amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, the progress view has a nice linear chain. But it has a deep problem explaining why certain points on that chain, including the reptiles and the mammals, should return to the water. Darwin's theory does not. At any point, whatever works in this environment to leave behind the most offspring is what leaves behind the most offspring. And if that includes a return to an aquatic lifestyle and an associated, simpler morphology, that's what we'll see. Okay. It can lead to unambiguous simplification over time. There's just one of many examples we could wheel out, but that's the Mexican blind cavefish, which has evolved to lose its eyes over time because it lives in an environment with insufficient light to make eyes a worthwhile investment of energy. But of course, and finally, we turn to the issue that evolutionary theory says that there is nothing prohibiting an increase in complexity over time. It's simply not an inevitable, mysterious drive that we need to account for. There's a different fish there, the leafy sea dragon. Beautiful seahorse, 
that mimics seaweed to an extraordinary extent. And maybe that's the sort of thing that we need to be talking about. How is it that genetic information over time could take a fairly bland ancestral fish condition and add genetic complexity so that it turns out to be so much more ornate and so much more genetically programmed to resemble its environment? Let me give you a brief syllogism and we can return to this at the very end. If I were to say to you, all books contain non-random information created by an intelligent designer, and then I was to say the phenomenon I'm currently looking at contains information like a book, would I then be able to conclude that the phenomenon I'm looking at was created by an intelligent designer? That's a classical example of a flawed syllogism. It would be logically equivalent to saying all dogs have four legs, teeth, fur, and a tail. The animal I'm looking at has four legs, teeth, fur, and a tail. Therefore, the animal I'm looking at is a dog. It would ignore the possibility that there are other explanations, other possible phenomena that would meet those criteria, but are not the particular example that I know so well. That's what I want to think about then with the increase of what we might call semantic or meaningful genetic information over time. The problem really creeps in if we focus on the organism in isolation. You'd find evolutionary biologists, myself included, often slipping into a shorthand to say something like the leafy sea dragon is a fish that has evolved over time to look like the seaweed that surrounds it in order to avoid being eaten by a predator. That carries some sort of implication or hint of an internal drive an internal purpose to what's going on. And it's incorrect. And as an evolutionary biologist, I would know that if somebody called me up on that, I should stop, rewind, and say something more careful. What I actually mean is the ancestors of this fish that looked more like seaweed survived and reproduced better than their relatives who looked less like seaweed. And that's the clue to where we think the information is coming from. The source of new semantic genetic information is the environment. When we talk about good or bad mutations, meaning that they increase or decrease fitness, we talk about the fitness of an organism. And very often that's associated with some sort of mental image of physical fitness. I want to change that perception in anybody's mind who's thinking that way to the concept of a fit between the organism and its environment. A fitter organism is one that better fits its environment. Where's the semantic information coming from that gets into genetic inf in material? It's coming from the environment. That's what we see with examples such as a walking stick insect or a leafy sea dragon. It is coming to resemble its environment. The information is already in the environment. What DNA is doing is capturing a small portion of that information over time in the sense that organisms with variations are like minor variations on a hypothesis. And whichever one of those variations is most successful, best fits its environment, is by definition the one that leaves behind the most offspring. The organism itself has not created information in a useful sense of the word create. What it has done is mirrored its environment slightly better than its competitors. It has captured more of that information from the environment. Now, of course, it's an incredibly complex game. Things such as plate tectonics mean that the environment is constantly changing, quite apart from annual fluctuations in weather and rainfall and all the conditions that can matter to life and death. And that's what keeps the game rolling on. In fact, there's more to it than that. And in the second half of the 20th century, evolutionary biologists began to really notice and take seriously the fact that much of an organism's environment is other organisms with which it interacts you can take a moment to look at some of the organisms that are up there on the screen and recognize in each case I've picked an adaptation that is clearly associated with interaction with another organism. So part of the information that can get captured and represented within the DNA programming of a genome is a response to other organisms that themselves are evolving. And that keeps up this strange, beautiful game in which evolution is taking place. So that's what I mean when I say that biological evolution describes a natural process that transfers information from a local environment into DNA. I think that something similar really is happening when gravity, a simple, well-understood, natural process, causes raindrops to form a puddle, and the shape of the ground beneath becomes reflected in the underside of the water. If I could wave a magic wand at that puddle and remove everything except for the water, I would see shapes locked into the underside of that water that could tell me something about the environment. If I couldn't see anything but the water, I might want to look for a new causal process that could somehow trap this meaningful information in something as simple as water. 
I think in that case it would be unambiguous that I was missing a simpler contextual explanation by ignoring the presence of the rocks, the seaweed, the garbage, whatever it is that's there underneath the water. And in terms of evolution, I'm struggling to understand why we have a mystery to explain in terms of where the semantic complexity of genetic information comes from. So I think that's all I wanted to say, um, except to just leave and say, okay, I can say such things as that in an evolution course whenever I want. Now I'm here with a brotherhood, sisterhood of faith. And in what I've just said to you, what is the transforming radical grace that makes this different? Why are we here? What can I do with that? And if the answer is simply to answer questions, then great. If the answer is something more challenging to me and what I've just said to you, then great. But with that, let me finish. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely question, a very thought-provoking one. I think the easy response gets away from the question by telling you that we're not anything like as divorced from the environment as we might like to believe. Uh, one of the recent findings is that for every cell in your body, you have nine bacterial cells in your body. You're more bacteria than you are you. Uh, another thing would be to recognize the tiny segment of human society that has gotten away from even the most primitive of conditions that define our survival and reproduction when we think about distribution of healthcare or even clean drinking water and food. Um, it's a very small number of us who can lay any claim to constructing our own environments. But having said that, let me try and take your question in the way it was intended and say that, yeah, to some extent we are creating environments from our own imaginations now, I guess. And I think that does place us in a new realm. And that most evolutionary biologists I know would say that we need to be extremely cautious in thinking about how evolution applies to the phenomenon of human culture, period. Uh, different rules at work. In particular, we're dealing with a Lamarckian phenomenon because you can give me an idea for a new habitat that I can take. I don't have to have that genetically programmed into me. That can spread as fast or as wide as it wants to. And so we tend to just say, that's not what we study. We don't know much about that. But thank you for a very thought-provoking question. Okay. Thank you for another excellent question. Actually, my speciality is very close to the origin of life, just after, but it's something I have not referred to at all, so thank you for bringing it up. I think the fairest thing that I can say to you is that we don't know how the origin of life occurred, and I can say that having just been at the 2012 Origin of Life conference. There are some good ideas about that, and there's a lot of interesting thinking. If I had to put my money on any one of the directions of that thinking right now, I would be particularly focused on a growing appreciation of the interaction between organisms and their environment, which fits nicely with this, and the recognition that order and structure exists in the physical universe quite beyond biology. Not to the same degree that we see in biology by any stretch of the imagination. But what I'm saying here is that geoscientists in particular are showing us ways in which minerals, crystals, and stuff like that can at least see the beginnings of order. When we see energy flowing through physical systems, um, the chemistry at work can often lead to local increases in order, decreases in entropy, um, and that looks promising. Having said that, that's an old idea that you can trace back at least as far as Cairn Smith to the 1960s, the idea that maybe clay minerals were the original genetic material. Lots of people would like that to be true. So far, the evidence, the pragmatic evidence, is pretty scant. So, sorry, I can't do better than that. Thank you. Could you 
go back to your silly slide. Thank you, yes. Somewhere. There we go. Whoops. Whoops. Okay. We're going one forwards. Hopefully it stays. Right. It seems to me that uh, that's not exactly the comparison that the intelligence design would suggest. We know that there are other features, other animals that have a four-legged speech that have to die, but do we really know of anything else that produces hooks? Thank you. Specified information? Very good thought. I must admit I wrote the syllogism last night, and that was the one thought that I had when I woke up this morning. <laughs> so thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> this I would refer again to the idea that if qualitatively, I think we do see ordered, structured information in the non-living universe. Um, one example that I just like because I learned it relatively recently, ice can exist in two forms. If ice forms in the cosmos far away from a star, temperature is sufficiently low, it forms in a phase that we know as amorphous ice, thoroughly random. You actually need to put some energy through that amorphous ice for it to partially melt and reconvene as ice crystals as we know them. Ice crystals, I think most people would agree, have an intuitive sense of more order about them than a random collection of frozen water molecules. And that would be just one example in the family of crystals and minerals where order spontaneously arises when you put energy through a system. Now, having said that, I do need to remain very humble to the fact that order within biology is orders of magnitude more complex than that. Perhaps it's a thought we can return to at lunchtime or even later in the day when I've let others have their say. Okay, thank you. One more. Oh. I thought your uh, word picture of uh, water droplet and the ground is Absolutely agree with you. In fact, that's plaster casts right there, right? So thank you very much for an extension to the analogy. I actually looked for a fun-shaped ice cube to make that point, but they weren't quite as clear as showing you a puddle, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs>